Good afternoon, everyone. It's really nice to have you here with us today again. I saw Terry and Randy there. Hi, and Karen, it's really nice to have you here. My wife, Nancy's here with me and my mom, Ruth. Here, it's a cool, chilly day. Yesterday, uh, I had the privilege of working with Alan Heilman. He came over. They had locked us out of our back lawn three or four weeks ago when we could have mowed it. And by the time the rain stopped, it was nearly four and a half to five feet tall at the tallest place. No way our mowers could handle that. So I called up the high school on Monday and asked them, since you locked us out, could you mow it? And they came over and mowed it and carted a lot of the grass away, but it needed to be finished. They just did a rough mowing. So Alan uh, came over yesterday and we spent the afternoon raking and mowing lawns. He did the raking, I did the riding on the riding lawnmower. So much thanks to Alan Heilman. I appreciate all your hard work yesterday. The lawn looks great. Nice to get back to just a little bit of ordinary life, but for many people, this is never an ordinary life. And I'm deeply mindful of that in these days. We have a lot of trouble in our life. Jesus promised us you will have trouble in this world, or he predicted that. You will have trouble, but take courage. I have overcome the world. And in days like these, it, you kind of wonder, how have you overcome the world? But we know that he has by the cross. He's put away the rule of the demonic forces and Satan. By the cross, he's forgiven us. And by the cross, he's offered the gift of eternal life to whoever would believe in him. It's an open inv invitation. Let's begin with prayer today. Father, I just uh, thank you so much for our Lord Jesus Christ. For such tender words that he gave us, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Thank you that even in those words is the beck and call to come out of the confines of religion and enter into that radical dance and relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we might live abundantly by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray for the worldwide church that you would be guiding us, that we would be listening to your voice, both through scripture but in that inward witness that you give us, that we would know as a community your clear direction in who you would have us be, and then out of that, what you would have us do. Father, most of all, we need your spirit in these days. We need a fresh outpouring every day of your Holy Spirit. So today I pray that you would fill us with an extraordinary and great measure of your spirit. I thank you for those wonderful words in Luke 11 that says, if you who are evil, speaking of us, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? In the contrast of you who are perfect in every way, and we whose lives has, have been corrupted by such evil, in that contrast, yes, we love to give good gifts to our children, but Father, you are sitting on the edge of your seat at every moment. And those verses, those words, keep asking, you, you will receive. Keep knocking, and or keep seeking, you will find. Keep knocking, and the door will be open to you. Gain entirely new meaning that we keep asking for your Holy Spirit. We keep seeking the things of the Spirit. We keep knocking for the doors that the Holy Spirit would open to us. And every time you promised us that you will answer. So today, Lord, we continue to ask for your Holy Spirit. We are here to seek the things of the Spirit, the guidance of the Spirit, the counsel of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the wisdom of the Spirit. 
We come knocking at your door, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would open up the doors in our day that you would have open to us, that we might not miss any of the good works which you have prepared beforehand, that we might walk in them. I pray that you would give us eyes this, today to see those good works in our life. Maybe a phone call, maybe a private message, maybe a hug, maybe a listening ear instead of a speaking mouth. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being for us. Thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. May that anointing which we have received teach us all things. Again, I pray for our world today, Lord, that you would silence the injustice against African Americans. that you would hold our nation to account, not for, for that injustice, Lord, and for all the other injustices that we continue to pile up. But in this day, and in this week, and in this time, Father, we pray that you would right the injustice against our African-American brothers and sisters and against people of color. I know at times as some of us who are Caucasian tend to deny its existence, the existence that African Americans and people of color of color are treated differently. But Father, I've seen it, experienced it firsthand over and over again. So Father, we, we pray that you would bring us to our knees. We pray that you would forgive us as a nation. That you would forgive us individually. And that we might educate ourselves and learn. And that your spirit might teach us about the reality of things. Father, I'm, I'm fully aware that sin has tainted and corrupted every human heart. And our only path out is our Lord Jesus Christ. What he did for us on the cross how he saved us through the resurrection, how he, through his ascension and the giving of his blood in the real temple, enabled the Father to send us the Holy Spirit by which our lives are being transformed even now into the very image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. And again, in the end, with the pandemic, we pray, take this cup from us. Yet being mindful of the good work you do through harsh, harsh circumstances, through the hard times, the deepest blessings seem to always come from the most difficult of times. Be mindful of that, Lord. We pray that your will would be done, not ours. Father, thank you for the rest and the peace that comes when we allow you and ask you that your will would be done in our lives. May we surrender. May we acquiesce. May we live with a thousand yeses on our lips. Yes to the Father, yes to the Son, yes to the Holy Spirit. Help us not to be stiff-necked, always resisting the Holy Spirit. Help us to come with open hearts, empty hands, 
Thank you that we come with cleansed souls and cleansed hearts by, by the blood of Jesus Christ. And in the end, I join with the Apostle John in praying. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Again, thank you for joining me today for Noontime Prayer and the reading of Psalm 32. I'm going to go ahead and read through it. It's a Psalm of David. It's called a Maskil. We'll get into that. And I'm again re reading from the New American Standard Bible. Psalm 32, verses 1 through 11. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is a man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle, to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. Many are, are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. So we begin. Psalm 32, again, it's a Psalm of David attributed in the Hebrew text and in the Septuagint to David. It's called a maskil, and there's not any clear certainty of what that means, but there's some thoughts on it. We know what the word can mean. There's two directions we can go with it. A maskil is to instruct, to give instruction, and that's the very thing this Psalm does. There's about eight or nine of these Psalms scattered throughout the 150 Psalms, uh, a maskil. Or it can be a sung meditation, still with that idea of meditating on truth and being instructed by truth. And now we get to the actual body of the, the psalm. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So there's a very interesting thing about this the, these two verses that I didn't notice at first. But there are three words for sin, transgression, sin, and iniquity. And so transgression is a word that means rebellion against God. And in the circumstance of David and the people of Israel, it would be rebellion against his law, transgressing his law, going beyond the boundaries of the law. The transgression is similar to the idea of trespass. You are trespassing the boundaries of the law, to transgress them. And then you have the word sin, and that's a more general term. And it comes from an old Hebrew word that was an archery term that meant to fall short of the, of the target, to fall short of the mark. So oftentimes we would think, and I would assume that David and the 
Hebrew people would think that to fall short, to miss the mark was to fall short of the law. But there's a much more ancient idea than falling short of the law that we find in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. And essentially, God had called Adam and Eve to just live in his presence, to live in this garden. Everything they needed was provided for them. He gave them only one command that they were not to do. Everything else was pr permissible. No law, just his presence and his love, that unconditional, immeasurable, boundless love of Yahweh, love of Elohim. And the mark that Adam and Eve failed to, to make, to hit, that target, was to live in the love of God. That's the basis of sin, is to look to ourself, to be gods to ourself, to look to our own ability to manufacture self-esteem and self-worth and meaning and purpose and direction and wisdom and counsel and righteousness and everything else you can pile on. And so oftentimes in, in churches, we have that idea of missing the mark of the law when actually sin is missing the mark of living in this vital relationship in the love of God, in the love of Jesus, and in the embodiment of that law and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And then the third word is iniquity. And iniquity is a word that in the Hebrew that means to twist. And so it can be a personal twistedness, but it tends to be the word that's talked about when it talks about visiting the iniquity of the fathers to their children and to the third and fourth generations. And so oftentimes it has a group connotation, a group meaning to it. Iniquity is our family sin. We do have family sins, whether it be lying or gossip or addiction or abuse or pride or haughtiness, or theft, or even murder, anger, rage, there's all kinds of iniquity. And some families have more than one, one iniquity that we struggle with. And it's up to each generation to put away that iniquity in our generation, in my generation. My father was a man of rage. I love him dearly. I've forgive, forgiven him for it. But he was a man of rage, and he passed that rage on to me. And when I first arrived at the church here 24 years ago, I met with a Greek group of people who helped me put that rage away. I still get angry, but I don't fall into a rage. And I'm so thankful because it's all of the Spirit's work. So you have these three words, transgression, rebelling against the law, rebelling against God, sin, missing the mark. Of, of the law, but more so of living in the love of God. And iniquity, all of these family sins and these this twistedness to our life, it pretty much covers the whole gamut of sin in these three words. It doesn't leave anything out. And then there's three other words in this text. Forgiven, covered, and does not impute. The word forgive is to let go, to release from the consequences and the penalty of one's sin. That's to be forgiven. Jesus says, or the Father says, Yahweh says, as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your sins from you. And again, I, your sins I will remember no more. What wonderful words. We remember them. We bring them back up to God. And I think sometimes God is thinking, I've forgiven you that a long time ago. What are you talking about? And then there's the word covered, and that has to do with the Day of Atonement, where the high priest would take a goat, two goats, one goat they would slaughter, but first with the other goat, they would the high priest would lay his hands over on the goat, as others probably held the goat, and he would read and confess the sins of the nation that had been brought to him, including his own sins, and he would read those sins and recite those sins and place them on the goat. And then they would slaughter the goat. They had two goats. And they would take the blood of that goat and take it into the 
the holy place and the high priest for that year would then take that blood into the Holy of Holies behind the veil that separated us from God's presence. And in the Holy of Holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant. Inside of the Ark of the Covenant was three things. The rod of, of Aaron, that rod that Moses used in the battles, a pot of manna, and then the tablets of the testimony, the Ten Commandments, engraved on letters with letters on stone. And then over that was a mercy seat on the lid, and it was thought that God's presence lived between the two angels, the two cherubim which were facing inward, above the mercy seat. So by placing the blood on, covering that mercy seat with blood, when God looks down on the law, he can't see it because it's covered with blood. That's the idea. Our sin is covered. In the New, in the New Testament, this same word is used by the Greek word, for which we translate as propitiation, which means a covering. And it's, again, that idea of our sin being covered by the blood so that the law has been covered. It's been completely fulfilled. And then lastly, uh, it does not impute iniquity, does not impute, and that's, it does not calculate or doesn't make a calculation of our iniquity against us. Like there's a set of books, it's the idea of accounting, that there's a set of books and every time you sin, there's a ledger entry made. And here it says, does not impute iniquity. So if we then look at each one of these pairs, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose rebellion against the law, whose rebellion against God, that's what really it is, is forgiven. I've been a rebel against God and he's forgiven me. I'm so grateful for how kind he's been to you and to me, whose transgression is forgiven, that rebellion, forgiven in the blood of Christ. Whose sin is covered, that missing the mark of keeping the law, but for us of missing the mark of living in the very real love of God, in the very real love and grace of Jesus, that love embodied in the person and presence of the Holy Spirit. We miss the mark of, of, of living in that vital relationship with him. And that's covered by the blood of Jesus. It's covered just as the mercy seat over the Ark of the Covenant is covered. And so that the just demands of the law, the just penalty of the law, the just curses of the law are covered by the blood of Christ. And in the third one, how blessed is the man to whom the Lord, Yahweh, does not impute iniquity, who does not calculate or make those ledger entries of iniquity against us. I know in my case, we've had our family iniquity. And I pray that the Lord would reveal them to me and then that the Holy Spirit would put them to death in me. I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit's work where we cannot some well where, where we cannot put to death by our flesh because our flesh is corrupt. We can always ask the Holy Spirit to come and put things to death in us. And our job is to surrender to his work. So putting it all together, this whole covering, this whole forgiveness of all of our sin, again those three words, transgression, sin, and iniquity, cover the whole gamut of our sin, of the world's sin. How blessed is he, how blessed is she, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the person to whom the Lord does not Im impute iniquity. And David is saying how blessed he is that his transgression has been forgiven, his sin covered, that God doesn't hold his iniquity against him. And lastly, in whose spirit there is no deceit? Well, as those who live in, in the flesh, we have deceit certainly in our soul. And so immediately I start going, well, I've had de deceit in my spirit, and at times it's, it still lingers. That's one of the things that I've asked God to put away in my life, deceit and lying. Moving on in the psalm, we get to Psalm verses, Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4, and it says, When I kept silent about my sin, 
My body wasted away th through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, but my vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. And then there's that word sila, which we're pretty sure that it means pause and meditate on what's been said. So you'll see me when I come to that word, I just pause and think about what's been said. It doesn't need to be a short pause either. We can actually meditate on what these words have said. So most scholars agree that we know the context of this psalm, that this is a companion to Psalm 51 where David confesses his sin in have, committing adultery with Bathsheba and having murdered Uriah or ordered him murdered. And uh, the scholars believe that this was written after Psalm 51. Psalm 51 was pro probably written right on the heels of David's sin. And this was written sometime after when David had had time to reflect on things and to understand how gracious God had been. And so that he could then in turn instruct those who were listening to him in what he had learned out of his grievous sin. So when he says, when I kept silent about my sin, that sin is in the story of Uriah and Bathsheba. And so again, I've read this story before in when it came up in a psalm, but I'm going to read it again because each of these are independent of each other. And so I want to read that whole story again, the story, the event, the account of the fall of David. and his committing adultery with Bathsheba. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, through chapter 12, verse 15. Then it happened in the spring at the time when the kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabah, but David stayed at Jerusalem. Notice it says, when the kings go out to battle, this was a time for David to be with his troops. Instead, he lingers in Jerusalem. doesn't tell us why, but he's basically on holiday, as I said last time. Now, when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. He shouldn't have been laying in the comfort of his bed. He shouldn't have been able to walk around on the king's house. He should have been with his troops. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing and the woman was beautiful in appearance and so he saw this naked woman bathing on a roof he shouldn't have been looking in the first place when he saw her he should have immediately looked away apparently he didn't so David sent and inquired about the woman he's already bearing sin in his heart by his thinking and his lust and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the daughter of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers and took her. And when she came, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanliness, she returned to her house. Notice what it says. David sent messengers and took her. You didn't refuse the king. You didn't refuse the king's messengers. Essentially, this is a rape in the, in the sense of him being in power and her having no power. He lay with her, and when she had purified herself from her uncleanliness, she returned to her house. There was a ritual they would undergo. I think it was a seven-day ritual, if I remember, so she was there for a while. David's committed adultery by force, even a rape. But there's always consequences to what we do. Very real consequences. And in this case, the woman conceived. And she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Now David has a dilemma. He will have ruined this woman's life if Uriah comes back and finds his wife pregnant without reason. If he stays silent about it, he will have destroyed Bathsheba's life. And so he concocts a scheme, a contingency plan to cover up his sin. 
Then David said to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David out of the front lines of the battle. When Uriah came to him, I'm sure Uriah is wondering, Why is David calling for me? I'm just one of the soldiers. I'm a Hittite. Uh, he was a foreigner. He was from another a nation. David, but fighting for the armies of Israel. David asked concerning the welfare of Joab and the people in the state of the war. So David makes it sound like he's just inquiring of him to get a report about how the war is going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. With the idea that once Uriah goes to his house, he will want to sleep with his wife because he's been away. And all of us men know that longing. And Uriah went out, out of the king's house. And a present from the king was sent after him. So now we have bribery heaped on top of it. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house and with all the servants of, of his lord and did not go down to his house. David was staying away from the battle, lounging on the rooftop, sleeping with other men's wives, while Uriah had the integrity not to go to his wife because none of his fellow soldiers could go. Now when they told David, saying Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? I brought you home. You can, you can enjoy being at home with your wife. Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters. The ark was yet in a tent. And Israel and Judah were, were still fighting the battles to gain control of the land away from the Canaanites at the time by God's instruction. The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters. And my Lord Joab and the servants of the Lord are camping in the open field. They're in the midst of the battle. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? What a contrast between this man who says, Look it, all of my compatriots are out in the battlefield. Israel is living in tents. How can I do this thing of going to my own house and sleeping with my wife, lying with her? When that's exactly what David is doing. There's a sharp contrast between David's behavior and his lack of integrity in this circumstance and Uriah's exemplary behavior and his integrity as a Hittite. So there's even a contrast between Uriah being a Hittite and David being uh, of the house of David, a, a Judean. By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. He swears by David's life that he will not do this thing. So he's just said, if I break it, may you basically take my life. I swear by your life, which means if it breaks it, he's, he's threatening David's life, which means he gets to die. I think that's how it works. Then David said to Uriah, stay here today also, and tomorrow I will let you go. I'm going to give Uriah another chance to get that longing for his wife. That very, we all understand it. I think women understand it too in a different perspective. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. So David let him stay a whole three nights trying to entice him to go to his wife. Now David called him and he ate and drank before him and he made him drunk. And the evening he went out to lie in his bed with his Lord's servants. So here David thinks if I can get him drunk, shut off part of his brain, shut off that integrity of his, he will certainly go and lie with his wife and then the pregnancy will be covered up. But he did not go down to the house. Even Uriah, in his drunken stupor, in his drunkenness, has more integrity than David in all of his sobriety. This event, this account, does not put David in a good light at all. And we get worse. It gets worse. Now in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to the hand of Uriah. This is where it gets shockingly evil. He had written in the letter saying, Place Uriah in the front line of the fiercest battle and withdraw from him so that he may be struck down and die. So it was as Joab kept watch in the city that he put Uriah at the place where he knew they were 
valiant men. The men of the city went out and fought against Joab, and some of the people among David's servants fell, and Uriah the Hittite also died. So he didn't have people withdraw, or did he? I think he put him with the valiant men at the front lines, and as a result, Uriah died. Joab shows more integrity than David. Then Joab sent and reported to David all the events of the war. He charged the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling all the events of the war of, to the king, and if it happens that the king's wrath rises and he says to you, Why did you go so near to the city to fight? Did you not know they would shoot from the wall? Who struck down Abimelech, the son of Drubasheth? Did not a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Thebes? Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So jo Joab makes it, concocts his story so that he doesn't reveal David's sin to anyone. Joab is a very lo loyal general. Doesn't ask why, just does it. So the messenger departed and came and reported to David all that jo Joab has set, sent him to tell. The messenger said to David, The men prevailed against us and came out against us in the field, and we pressed them as far as the entrance of the gate. Now maybe that's what really happened. We don't know. Was it archers from the wall? Did the men come out of the city? We really don't know. It sounds like this may be, be the truth of it, but no, we know that actually Joab had put Uriah in with the valiant men near the, near the city. Moreover, the archers shot at the servants from the wall, so it was the archers. So some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. Now David has escaped. Uriah finding out about the pregnancy, he's escaped, supposedly, he thinks he's escaped the consequences of his sin. Then David sent to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you. For the sword devours one as well as another. Make your battle against the city stronger and overthrow it, and so encourage him. Now when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. I wonder if she had any inkling that David had done this. You wonder if there was ever any inkling in her life that David had done this. She's going to find out later because the whole court finds out when Nathan comes before David. When the time of mourning was over, David sent and brought her into his house, and she became his wife. Then she bore him a son. But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. Let's see. Let's calculate what he had done. He lied. He deceived. He bore false witness. He murdered. He committed adultery. He coveted another man's wife. He dishonored his mother, mother and father for sure. That's half the law. You could even argue that he uh, fell to the idolatry of his own uh, lust. And moving into chapter 12, we read the Lord's response to it, that there's consequences to our sin. Then the Lord, Yahweh, Jesus sent Nathan to David and he came to him and said, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he brought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom and was like a daughter to him. This little lamb, it's all he had. Now a tra traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. It's getting that by this time David had concubines and more than one wife. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and had no compassion. 
When we sin, sometimes we are then blinded to our own sin and what we've done. Nathan then said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, It is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord, the word of Yahweh, by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You murdered him. You have taken his wife, his wife to be your wife. You've committed adultery and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Notice he keeps calling her the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. We know that his son Absalom will do that in the coming days, in the coming years. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, all Israel and under the sun. So when Absalom commits this atrocity in sleeping with David's concubines, he does it on the roof of, of the house in a tent under the sun before all the people of Israel so that they can see. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against Yahweh. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. The consequences of what David did was death. But the Lord took away his sin. You shall not die. Yet there remains consequences. However, because of this deed, you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. You've been the cause of derision against the Lord. You've made the Lord a laughingstock by what you've done. The child also that is born to you shall surely die. So Nathan went to his house. Then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David, so that he was very sick. So there's the shocking account of David and his sin, which he committed against Bathsheba and against Uriah, against the Lord and against the people of Israel. Now we return to our psalm, when I kept silent about my sin. Now we see clearly what sin he's talking about. My body wasted away through my groaning all day long. Isn't that the reality when we fall into sin? That our consciences, our inner life is in turmoil because we know we've done this, this wrong. Some people live in a state of inner turmoil where they groan all day long. I remember during the days of my drug abuse and while living, I had this constant groaning within. And so I would use more drugs because the drugs would cover it up. The alcohol would, in the blackout, would take it away. I could forget it for a time. And then I would do something stupid and the groaning would be all the worse. That inner shame, that inner self-hatred would only be all the worse. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. For David, the Holy Spirit, the hand of God was heavy on him. So it wasn't just the conviction of his conscience and his inner turmoil. But it was a conviction directly from the hand of God who was weighing heavy. He was in the wine press of God's hand pressing down on him. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. When you're living under the cloud of sin, life has no vitality. There's no joy in life. There is no exuberance to life. There is a depression, a very real being cast down under the guilt of our sin, under the shame of our sin, under the burden of our sin. It's like going around life carrying a 90-pound pack and trying to maintain the secrecy that we're wearing a 90-pound pack. So oftentimes, those around us see the 90-pound pack on our back. They're fully aware of the sin. They're fully aware of what we're doing, and we think we have it hidden. And then Sila, pause on this. How courageous of David to be so forthright. 
So there is a period of time between when he had Uriah killed and when Nathan comes and confronts him. We don't know how many days that was or how many months it was that God allowed David to be stewing in his sin, in his guilt, in his shame. All of David's vitality was drained away. All of my vitality has been drained away in those seasons when I've allowed sin to grip my life. I acknowledge my sin to you. This is the longest verse in the psalm, and this is kind of the heart of the psalm. I acknowledge my sin to you. I owned up to it. I said, God, that was sin. I did it. And my iniquity I did not hide. The twistedness of my life, this perversity that I have allowed to happen, this murder. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord that rebellion against the law and that rebellion against the Lord. He had rebelled against the law in committing adultery. He had re rebelled against the law in coveting his neighbor's wife. He had rebelled against the law in murdering Uriah and then lying about it or covering it up. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. And so it begins with this idea of, I acknowledge my sin to you. We talk about confession a lot in the church, that we need to be confessing our sins continually. I think we've turned that term into a religious term. The, the Greek word for confess means to say the same thing as. God says, that's sin. And I go, no, it's not. God says, that's sin, Grant. No, no, it's not. I, I, I'm doing not quite fine in it. It's a lot of fun until the bondage takes over until the guilt takes over until the shame takes over okay lord i agree with you that's sin that's confession i acknowledge my sin to you and notice in this verse we have sin iniquity and transgression the fullness the completeness of our sin of david's sin that iniquity that twistedness that sin that failure to hit the mark of keeping the law for David, but living in the love of God for all of us. And I will confess my transgressions. There's that word confess. It means, again, to acknowledge to God, to confess to God. It's We confess things. We have verbal confessions. I confess the Lord Jesus Christ. I say, He is mine. I have entrusted my life to Him. He is my Lord and my Savior. He is my God and my Savior. That's confession. And in the same way, when we confess our sins, it's acknowledging it, confessing it to the Lord is, is saying, I agree, that's sin. I agree with you, that's sin. And then these profound words, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. You remove the guilt from me, so I'm guiltless. Herein is much instruction for us. Ponder this. We move on. Therefore, let everyone who is Godly, pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in, in, in a flood of great waters they will not reach him. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a, in a time when you may be found. And the ones who are godly within the context of David and the Hebrew people are those who follow the law. And yet herein, David had not been godly. He had been anything but godly until he confessed his sin and the Lord had taken away his, the guilt of his sin. And what he's getting at, we all fall to sin. And there's a flood coming. That flood is going back to Genesis and the judgment of God upon sin through the flood. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. And so he's using that illusion. We know that God promised that he will never flood the world again. But he's never promised that he will not judge our lives, that he will not discipline us, that he will not bring a sense of hardship unto our lives until we get that we're in sin and confess it to him, acknowledge it to him, say the same thing as him, yeah, Lord, that's sin. And then he gets to these wonderful words. When we live in a place of forgiven sin, of pardoned sin, when we have confessed our sins, when we have agreed that we are sinners, 
then we read these words, you are my hiding place. Yahweh, Jesus, you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You preserve me from the trouble of my own self. David's worst enemy, does, turns out it wasn't Saul, it wasn't Absalom, it wasn't his enemies in the surrounding territories. Certainly they were enemies, but his worst enemy was David himself. And your worst enemy is yourself. My worst enemy is myself. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from the trouble I bring upon my own head and upon your own head. The trouble I bring upon your head. No, the trouble you bring upon your own head. You surround me with songs of deliverance. This wonderful music of praise, praising God for his deliverance, praising God for redeeming us, for freeing us from our sin, from forgiving us, or for forgiving us. There are certain songs of deliverance that the Lord has put in my life. When he first drew me home out of my wild living and my drug abuse and my petty dealing and my alcoholism through that severe head injury I had, I, my parents very graciously, my mom sitting here and my dad very graciously invited me to come and live with them. The first thing my dad did, I actually slept in the closet in my parents' kitchen as because the house was unfinished. They were living in a little camper down in the, ba in the garage as dad was working on finishing the house. They had retired from Japan. Before they had left for Japan, they had built the, the outward frame of the house put on all the siding, but they had never finished the interior. It was just bare studs. So the first thing my dad did was finish my room so I would have a room. And it was in that room I had a very nice stereo back then. It spent way too much money on a very nice stereo. And I listened to a song by Wendy and Mary called Welcome Home. You're at peace with yourself. You're at peace with life. Welcome home. And that song, I would listen to it over and over again as it brought that healing balm of the Holy Spirit and of acceptance and of forgiveness, that my sins were forgiven, that all of that shame that I had walked in was wiped away by the blood of Christ, was covered over. My rebellion of, against God was forgiven. My missing the mark of living in his love was now covered over by the blood of Christ, and now I can actually live in the boundless, immeasurable reaches of the love of God. And he had forgiven my iniquity. And that was, that's an ongoing thing in my life as it is in yours. There was other songs in my life too that he filled my life with in those days. You surround me with songs of deliverance. One was from Rich Mullins, My Deliverer is Coming. And I used to pick up Sarah in one hand and Nicole in the other arm. And we would, in the living room here, spin and twirl and dance to that song, My Deliverer is Coming, in wild abandon. You surround me with songs of deliverance. What are your songs of deliverance? Do you have a song of deliverance today that brings joy to your heart, that shouts out what God has done for you? One new one for me is, uh, I raise an alleluia. Ponder these things. You are my hiding place. And then some of the commentators, the scholars disagree on this. I side with one side. There's a turn in the psalm, and now God is speaking directly to David and to us. Some people think that this is still David speaking, and I, I think that's hard to understand because of this, the second line of this. No, this is God speaking to the hearer of the psalm. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you shall go. Which means on our part, we need to be listening. We need to be asking God to teach us to hear his voice and to know, to have the discernment, to know the difference between his voice, the enemy's voice, and the voice of our flesh. Teach me your voice, O Lord. Let me hear your voice through your word, through the counsel of the community of believers. And through the, in, the direct witness of your Holy Spirit, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. So the Holy Spirit is called the wonderful counselor. Jesus is called the wonderful counselor. In Isaiah 11, it says that the spirit of wisdom and counsel, speaking of the Holy Spirit, 
And so God counsels us and he keeps his eye on us. I don't see how David could keep his eye upon all the people after him having done such a dastardly thing. Seems kind of hypocritical to me. So I think this is surely God. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. There is further revelation in the new covenant. A revelation that David did not have yet. Verse 9, do not be as the horse, the stilled God talking to us, or as the mule, which have no understanding. They're rather simple and stupid animals whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. They have to have a bit and bridle so they just don't go running off or go whichever way they want. I know I've ridden horses. It's not one of my favorite things to do because I'm very allergic to them. But when I've the last time I rode a horse, my horse took a liking to the flank of the horse in front of me and kept trying to bite the horse in front of me in the rump. And it was not a fun ride because I had to be constantly being pulling back on the reins, saying, whoa, 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 trying to keep him from biting the horse in front of me and ca causing that horse to rear and buck the poor woman off of that horse. I'm glad I had a bridle on that horse to keep him in check. And we are like horses sometimes. He's saying, do you really need the bit and bridle of the law? Otherwise, they will not come near to you. Horses require that. Don't be like that. Listen to my voice. And for us, it's listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We can continually ask. I've been asking the Lord to teach me to walk in the Spirit, to be led of the Spirit, since that head injury. I continue to pray that because I'm not quite here, there yet. I'm still learning. And I've been teaching him to clarify his voice so that my, I may hear his voice for years. And I continue to pray that prayer also. So he says, don't be like a stubborn mule or a stubborn horse who needs a bit and bridle to hold them in check. And then the last two verses, many are the sorrows of the wicked. Many are the sorrows of the wicked because sin always has consequences. Just like it did in David's life, he had the groaning all day long because of his guilt and his shame. He had the hand of God heavy on him. And then he had the sorrow of the consequences of, of his sin, of losing the baby that Bathsheba bore to him. But in contrast to the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in Yahweh, in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. And that loving kindness is that hesed, covenant love shall surround us. We have hesed love in the new covenant. It's called the grace and unconditional love of Jesus. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones. And shout for joy, all of you who are upright in heart. I have a little bit difficulty in hearing these words because David was anything but righteous in his actions with Uriah and Bathsheba. And shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. So all I can say is David has been made righteous. He has been made upright by God taking away the guilt of his sin. And so those opening words in Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, Paul actually quotes those ver uh, verses in Romans chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. I'm not going to go there because you would have to uh, unpack the entire argument of Romans to understand it. But basically, pa Paul uses this psalm to uphold justification by faith, not by the law. And if you read through it, you don't need a, a bit and bridle. That's the law. One of my favorite teachers, Malcolm Smith, says, you know, giving people the law is just like putting a muzzle on a dog. You can give them all kinds of rules, even the rules of our own making. It keeps the dog, dog from biting until, unless it chews through the, through the muzzle. But it sure wants to bite you. Hasn't changed the dog's heart at all. And in the same way, the law can restrain us, but it doesn't do anything to restrain the wickedness of our hearts.
So there you have Psalm 30, 32. But I want to take just a, a brief moment to look at a couple texts in, in the New Covenant to understand exactly how that righteousness, that forgiveness is wrought in our lives. So in Titus chapter verses 3, or chapter 3, verses 3 through 7, we read Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. For we also once were foolish ourselves. I was foolish. And I suspect you were foolish, whether foolish in your pride or foolish in the sins of the flesh. We all also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending in our, our life in malice and envy, hating one another. That describes every human being on the planet, except Jesus. That describes you. And it describes me. I know this full well. And then the, this wonderful contrast. But when the kindness of God our Savior, do you hear that? When the kindness, when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, that love was there when we were in our foolishness, in our disobedience, in our deception, in our being enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, when we were spending our life in malice and envy, hating, hateful, hating one another. In that place, when we were still in our junk, the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared. And he appeared in the person of Jesus Christ. He saved us. We didn't save ourselves. So oftentimes we give ourselves credit for the salvation because of what we have done. No, he saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. And so back in Psalm 32, it's not, even David would say, it's not his deeds done in righteousness because his, de his deeds were anything but righteous. Not on the basis of basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness but according to his mercy i've always I, i've learned a little it's not really a jingle but a, a way of remembering what mercy is and what grace is and they're kind of flip sides of the same coin but mercy is not giving us what we deserve you and i deserve hell we deserve death we deserve the cross we deserve the 39 lashes. And he doesn't give it to us. And then grace is giving to us what we don't deserve. Life, eternal life, forgiveness, hope, peace, joy, and eternal inheritance. But according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. This is that whole concept of being born anew, being born again. By the washing of regeneration, when we are, that word is the word that we, that can mean from a, a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. It doesn't mean making a life better. It means making a life brand new, starting from the ground up and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The Holy Spirit has already been poured out on us richly because God made us alive in order that he could pour out his Holy Spirit upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. But it's something we continue to ask for. So that being justified by his grace, by this undeserved, unmerited, kind, and generous power of God, to forgive, save, and transform broken and sinful lives forever. That being justified by his grace, his divine favor, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We would be made heirs of the hope of eternal life. You and I are already heirs because of believing in Jesus of the hope of eternal life. We've already received it, and yet my body is struggling with cancer, I know some of you are struggling with life-threatening Ill illnesses, and yet we have this deposit of eternal life. One day it will be fully realized. We have it now, and yet this not-yetness to it. 
One day I will have and you will have brand new bodies, bodies that do not get tired, bodies that do not wear out, bodies that are indestructible. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, we shall be changed in the, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And so herein you see this encapsulation of the entire gospel. Mercy, grace, justification, regeneration, salvation, his love for mankind, eternal life. And none of it on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. And then three more texts. This is about forgiveness. David has said, how blessed is a man whose sins have been forgiven. In Ephesians 4.32, it says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other. We are to forgive each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. I did a very careful study of the word forgiveness in, in the New Testament, looking at every occurrence of the five words which, which we tr translate by forgiveness. And what I discovered was, prior to the cross, it's so frequently conditional. If you forgive, then you will be forgiven. After the cross, that condition never occurs again. And now the condition is reversed. We forgive each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. He's already forgiven us. We're already completely forgiven. Colossians 3, verses 12 and 13. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved. Is that how you think of yourself? We're chosen of God. No, I chose him. Don't argue with him. Just accept the fact that God chose you. Thank you, God, for choosing me. Thank you, God, for choosing each person watching today as we freely came to believe and be persuaded that you are the Messiah, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, do you know that you are holy and beloved? Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. All of those are also most of those are also listed as fruit of the Holy Spirit not all of them and so when we know that when he says put on these he's asking us to live in the fruit of the Spirit the only way I know how to put these on is to put on our Lord Jesus Christ to have him living in me to have the Holy Spirit leading my life so that I am producing the fruit or that so that not me so that he is producing the fruit of the Spirit in my life and then it says bearing one with one another that's a lost virtue, forbearance, putting up with one another by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then notice in forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against you, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. This is not saying you better forgive, otherwise God won't forgive you. Twice now we've seen forgive because you've already been forgiven everything. One last one from Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, very much words akin to Titus 3, verse 3, and to Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with Jesus. God made you alive together with Jesus, having forgiven us all the transgressions up until now, all the transgressions that I have remembered to confess, only those. It's not what the scripture says, folks. He made you alive together with him. God made you alive together with Jesus, having forgiven us all our transgressions, all our rebellion against God. And here it's talking about all sin, having canceled out the certificate, certificate of debt, consisting of degrees against decrees against us. Literally, that's having canceled out the handwriting consisting of decrees against us. And in Ephesians, when it uses this term, decrees against us, it's clearly in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, it's speaking of the law. What was the handwriting against us? The Ten Commandments. If you've broken them, they are against you because you have earned the penalty of death and get this, which was hostile to us. The law, because of our sin, was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Pilate had put 
king of the Jews, that Jesus was be, being tried for being king of the Jews. What God nailed to the cross as the real reason for why Jesus had to die was all the just requirements of the law. It's curse. All the curses listed in Deuteronomy, those 70 some verses of curse, all of the just penalty of the law, which was death, was nailed to the cross of Jesus. And he has taken it out of the way. We are no longer under law, but under grace. Some people will accuse me of antinomianism. No, I'm a reader, a plain reader of Scripture. We're now under the Spirit. Which is better, to have an external law by which we live according to our corrupt flesh? Or is it better to have the author of the law come to live out his life in us and through us? We have this treasure of the ministry of, this, of the Spirit. We have this treasure of the indwelling Christ in earthen vessels to show that this transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. When he disarmed the rulers and authorities, do you realize he's disarmed the demonic hosts? He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through Jesus. All of our transgressions are, are forgiven. We even sing this in, in the song, in the hymn, which is the hymn? Uh, Not Be Still My Soul. It's the one that was written by the man in Chicago when he lost his family at sea. No, that's a different one. It'll come to me. Welcome to Lupron. Yeah, it really does a number on my memory. But it says, not, our, not the part, not our sin in part, but the whole. It is well with my soul. There we go. It's that song. Read the psalm. It says, not the part, but the whole. I think there is a reality in our life. I lived under, when I was in seminary, and I grew up under this theology that you have to have a short list theology a short list of sin, because if you let your list of sins get too, too long, you, you could backslide right out of the church, and then you could backslide right out of salvation, right out of eternal life. So I was always afraid. Have I, did I confess that sin? How many? And, you know, I've confessed certain sins thousands of times. And here it says, all of our transgressions have been forgiven. How many of your transgressions were future at the cross when they were nailed to it? How many of your transgressions were future at the cross? All of them. Does this give you license to sin? With Paul, I say, may it never be. What this does for me, and I hope that this does the same thing for you, it, it, it draws me close it, it beckons me to draw in close to this one who would so love me and who would so love you that he would give up his life to cover all of your sins, to pay, pay the full brunt of the penalty of it. Oh, we still acknowledge our sin to him because it, 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 it clouds us. It doesn't cloud God. It doesn't change his love for us. It doesn't change the fact that we have been justified or acquitted or forgiven. But it restores harmony. So who are the righteous? Not those who are righteous by their own deeds, but are righteous by the gift of God through the death and resurrection of Jesus because we are justified by Christ, by his grace. Having been justified by his grace. Having been acquitted of all wrongdoing by his tender grace. So now we return to the last few verses or the first two verses of the psalm. How blessed is he, how blessed is she, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man, how blessed is the woman, to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. We are approaching brutal honesty. But doesn't that describe the whole gamut of our sin? And that, doesn't that describe the whole gamut of our sin, the whole measure of our sin, transgression, sin, and iniquity that was covered by the blood of Christ, that was forgiven in the blood of Christ, so that none of our iniquity is ever put to our ledger again. We are forgiven. I suspect that until we receive the fullness of 
of the pardon. We live under this constant worry and fear that I haven't done enough, that I haven't confessed enough. I pray that today is a day that you apprehend that you have been fully forgiven, that you receive the fullness of your pardon, and that you don't use it as a license to go out and sin. May it never be. Grace never gives us a license to sin. What I've learned is that in my flesh, I can't generate anything. There's no good that dwells in my flesh. There's no good that dwells in your flesh. We are not adequate in ourselves to consider anything our, in ourselves coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him. He who abides in me and I in him. He it is that bears much fruit. She it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Contemplate on those words, Selah. Everything we have, all righteousness, all acts of kindness, even the love that we have is all gift. Even the faith that we have is said to be measured to us, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is a man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Amen. Well, thanks for sticking it out with me. Really appreciate the time you take to, to watch and listen. I hope this has edified your soul. I hope this has built you a little bit stronger in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the knowledge of what he has done for us. And I pray that you have received the fullness of his pardon. You receive it by acknowledging it. It's, it's mine. I'm forgiven. The power of sin is broken in our lives. And one day it will be fully realized. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you that we don't live unto ourselves. I love these words in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29, when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. And we know that first Clement wrote in a letter that that yoke is the yoke of your grace. Take the yoke of my grace upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Thank you, Father, that Jesus is a teacher, gentle and lowly in heart. One from whom it's easy to learn. Who I want to come and sit at his feet. Who I'm drawn near to because of his infectious love. His boundless compassion. Thank you that he does not throw away bruised reeds or smoldering wicks. That there's no one beyond the pale of your love and grace. The grace of Jesus. Thank you that you come and beckon us not to live a life independent of you, even though we believed, but a life yoked to your grace, yoked to our Lord Jesus Christ, so that where he goes, we go. Where the Holy Spirit leads us, we follow. I pray that you would keep us all safe. I pray for justice in our society, Lord, by your Spirit. I pray for great revival. Lord, we've stopped expecting for revival and we look to all of our ministry technology to, to try to fill in the gaps and revival won't come as long as we are relying on our ministry technologies. So forgive us, Lord, for relying on ourselves, for believing the lie that we can produce any of this. And we pray for true revival in our land, that you would do whatever it takes in our country and in our world to bring a revival upon us. There are naysayers who say, no, it's the end times. There will not be a revival. Well, in every age, we believed we're in the end times, and if that's a defeatist view. And so, Father, we pray for revival. We pray for a great awakening in our cities, in our states, in our nation, in our world, that your spirit would be poured out in great and extraordinary measure upon us, Lord. We have not because we ask not. So as one voice, as one church, let us start praying for the Holy Spirit to be poured out in extraordinary measure upon this world, that the conviction of the Holy Spirit 
might fall upon people, that they might cry out to God for grace. Father, hear our prayer. Hear our heart's longing that we don't want these people all around us, people we love and people we know and people we don't know who we will learn to love, filled with your love. Bring a great harvest in and prepare us to be the harvesters. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Flood this nation, flood this world with your spirit. A tsunami of your spirit, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining me. I won't be back tomorrow. I'm taking, uh, I have my Bible study tonight, our Bible study, our Covenant Group Bible study at 7 p.m. If you're interested, you can contact me via Facebook Messenger, or you can text me, or you can call me, and I will give you the instructions on how you can join us. We're continuing to, to study the discipleship of grace, and we're in the unit called the Descent of Man, and in the chapter from Adam to the 12 uh, sons, to the 12 brothers. We are in the story of Joseph right now. So I hope you can join us tonight. And then on Sunday, we're going to be celebrating Communion Sunday. So if you could prepare to have bread and some beverage, it doesn't matter what kind of bread or beverage, just have something prepared. And we'll be looking again at the Song of the Suffering Servant in Isaiah 52 and 53. We're returning to that uh, series on Communion Sundays. Thanks for joining me today. Our benediction is the full Scripture from Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Jesus' words. Hear these words. Jesus' words to you. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.